let us look to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get into our study for the evening. So let's pray. Lord God, once again, as we come together on this uh, peaceful and beautiful Tuesday evening, we're thankful. Again, uh, more than ever, we do not take lightly the privilege that we have to assemble and just to enjoy fellowship with one another, to encourage one another, to open your word and uh, just to consider. Lord, our desire in these days that we're gathering over the next few Tuesdays is to understand a little bit more accurately uh, what your word says with regard uh, to the church, um, what it is, uh, how it came to be, and, and how it um, is to function. So Lord, we pray that we would lay some of the uh, groundwork for that this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Now, when you, when you study the New Testament, the very first occasion that you come across the word church in the entirety of the New Testament is there in the first part uh, on top of page one, and that's in Matthew 16, verse 18. And it says this, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's Matthew 16, 18. Then it's mentioned again in Matthew 18, and that's it for the entirety of the Gospels. Then the word is taken up again as we move forward. Now, I don't usually use a lot of uh, extra biblical quotes. I'm aware of that. But there is one that I, I used today, and that is from Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. He says these words, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And that is a common problem. Uh, my hermeneutics professor, hermeneutics is the study of the interpretation of the scripture. On the very first day of class, he, he, he taught us this little saying that's like a children's saying, and he said this, wonderful things in the Bible I see, most of them put there by you and by me. And that's not the way we want to do it. We don't want to put our ideas and impose it upon the scriptures. We want the scriptures to teach us, and sometimes that's challenging because we live in a different age, a different era, a different culture, different circumstances. And we're dependent to some degree even on the translations that we study. So that's why I started out on the top there with a question that said, what is the church? But even that is a loaded question. Because there's not, but there's not a single answer to that. To ask the question in that way presupposes an answer. You know, like if you ask uh, a teacher, ask a student, you know, why did you not study for this exam? It's presupposing they did not study, whereas maybe they did, and they're just a bit daft. I, you know, you don't know what the circumstances are, but uh, that question doesn't quite cover it. Many times, the reason why we come to wrong conclusions, I'm going to read a bit of this to and hopefully I wrote it correctly, um, is that we ask the wrong questions. The questions seem to presuppose that there is one and only one use or meaning of the church. And of course, the tragedy is al also that most commonly, as, as every church today kind of knows, it's not the building, it's the people, right? We've heard that a billion times, and hopefully we've got that, uh, but we still end up saying what? Yeah, I'll meet you at the church, often the church at church, and we're referring to the facilities, the place of the gathering for, for God's people, and uh, that's reasonably common. But what I want us to understand is also this, part of our challenge is, when you look at the word ecclesia, and the variance of that term ecclesia, which is the word that we most commonly translate church, it is not always translated church. 
sometimes in passages where it's clearly not referring to what we call the church, it translates it differently. And so we get messed up because the word is translated in different ways and in different places, and so we get just a bit presumptuous. And when I, I say this to the, to the extent that some men with a, a, a great degree of commitment to God's word and a great degree of sincerity and earnestness will lock into one particular use of church in the New Testament. And they'll say, whenever you see church, it means this, and they'll give five or six proof texts. And in those texts, for the most part, that is what that word means. But those aren't the only places it's used. And there are other places that it's used differently. And we know this as well. When, when, we, when the scripture speaks about us um, not walking in darkness, but walking in the light. Now, our, uh, we hopefully understand there can be two meanings for darkness. One is the lights are out. And the other is sinfulness. Now, to not walk in darkness, does that mean if you do not have a bedside lamp and turn it on before you get up at night to go somewhere, you're walking in darkness, thus in violation of the Scripture? Yes or no? No, no, no. That is uh, uh, an oversimplification. I I'll tell you this. Walk in physical darkness a lot if that will keep you from walking in spiritual darkness and sinful ways of living. So we want to be careful on how the scripture uses it, use it in the singular, singular, uses it in the plural. Sometimes, though, in, in the course of um, uh, interacting with uh, men and in, in the course of serving the Lord, sometimes what's interesting is when untrained men with very little grasp of biblical languages and limited exposure, exposure to ecclesiology confidently declare uh, disagreement on things related to the church or doctrinal issues. Imagine, and I've tried this and nobody's taken me up on it. Imagine the same thing in the realm of surgery. I've offered to one another, one or the another of you, to watch a YouTube video and then give a shot at a gallbladder surgery or whatever it may be. And nobody's ready for me to do that. And I do understand that because is watching a video or two or reading an article sufficient no you would not want me cutting you open and attempting to remove things and then patch you back up you would not want that and yet that that uh, the worst that could happen is the end of your body you die but listen a mishandling of the word of god can result in a loss of the gospel in the proclamation of a false gospel, a false Christ, and the loss is far more significant. You know, it, it, it's it, without overplaying it, when Paul does say to Timothy to pay close attention to yourself and your teaching, because in so doing, you save both yourself and your hearers. That speaks of a significant impact of his right teaching on the salvation or deliverance of his hearers. Also, when Peter speaks of the wisdom with which Paul writes, he says that the um, ignorant or untrained and unstable twist and pervert his teaching as they do with the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. That's a strong word. Destruction. Saved. And so uh, the same kind of thing in, in so many different areas. Uh, I, I've given a, a few examples. Uh, uh, electric wiring. Would you want someone who knows not what they're doing to do that? No, because if they get the wiring want wrong, uh, a few things could happen. It just keeps tripping the breaker and you can't get anything accomplished. That's on the positive end of possibilities. On the more negative end, it renders a fire. And then the, the effect is, is more destructive. The same thing. Would you want someone working in your pharmacy who only 
doesn't know what the different medicines are. So we're, did you want a red pill or, or a white pill? I don't understand. Uh, white. Do you want one that's, that's oval or a little bit triangular? That's not helping me the shape and color. This is the medicine that I need. And so on and so forth. In, in so many different areas of life, we understand. And look, we don't turn off our brains. We try to cope. We try to grow. We try to learn. And that is good. But we ought to give some consideration. Now we are wonderfully living in the age in which everybody is an amateur virologist, right? Every politician seems to have incredibly intense knowledge of the effect of viruses and what we ought to do and what would happen if schools were open and what would happen if businesses were open. It's amazing, but do they know? Even those who are virologists legitimately would have to say, this might happen. We are not sure. Uh, a lot of it, to a degree, ends up being like meteorology, which is a 30% chance of rain. Sometimes it will even say 100% chance of rain, to which it still might not rain because they got it wrong. And it ends up raining on a different day. So all I, all I want us to get is this. That isn't that, oh, we can't, we can't learn anything. We can't have any independent thoughts. Thankfully, God has given us his word. And every, almost every translation that we have commonly available and commonly in use is sufficiently accurate and sufficiently clear for us to have a very solid and firm foundation of the gospel. But I still want us to be cautious. For example, and I just give you an example of how this can err. If you were to look in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, just to give an example, because it's useful to have practical examples. In Acts 2, verse 40, the ESV says, following the tradition of the King James, says this, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. We'll tell you this. I, uh, we have a multitude of students from many different backgrounds who come to the seminary in India. And they will often ask this question. If God must save us and we do not save ourselves, then why does this verse say, save yourselves? It's a very good question. But there's an even better answer. This translation says, save yourselves. This verse does not. Excuse me? Because this word here is in the passive. Now, a word that is in the passive simply means this. It's not something that you do. It's something that must be done to you. It is an imperative. It is a must and an imperative active means you must do it. An imperative passive is it must be done to you. For example, you must be born again. Well, that's something that must be done to you. This, this would rightly be translated, you must be saved. Some, uh, I believe it's the, maybe the New American Standard that says, uh, be ye saved which carries the sense. But, but people will get wrapped up. No, no, no. Bible says save yourself so we can save ourselves. It does not. This word is in the passive. If I was to literally translate this passage, it ought to say you must be saved from this crooked and perverse generation. Now, some of you would say, well, then why did they not translate it that way? Because a lot of translation doesn't want to deviate too much from the familiarity of what is in the traditional King James. So some are cautious. Some other modern translations have handled this more accurately. There is, if you want to see the same word in the active, 
you would find uh, it in the active in Luke 23, verse 37. This is where Jesus is on the cross, and they say to him, if you are the king of Jews, save yourself. That's in the active, because they're telling him to do it. Acts chapter 2 is in the passive. They're telling you it must be done. And when, when, they're, when it, you're told you must be born again, when you're told you must be saved from this generation, you say, but how? And they say, cry out to the Lord for mercy. Cry out to the Lord that he might save you. Cry out to him because it's not within you. It must be done to you. And so helpful if the translations were right. Now that said, how many of us easily have a knowledge of the Greek? And even if we can somehow phonetically sound it out, do we all know which words are in the imperative and which words are in the present active or in the passive or in the aorist? Do we know these things? No, we don't all know these things. And so... That's why God has given for there to be teachers in the church. And those who stand and cheat, teach will face a stricter judgment. Okay? And so that is a tremendous responsibility. But I want us to know that. And again, you've got to be cautious with translations. Even as, as most translations, I say, are quite faithful, you still find some peculiar ones even in some of the more ancient. Many of you are probably acquainted with the classic King James translation and might be shocked to know there are nine references to unicorns, which are not, which are in every other transla translation is wild bulls or wild ox. It's, it's some ancient animal, but for some reason, the King James translators went with unicorns. Um. Which is why we, we, you know, we've, we want to be careful and take a full, thorough study as we get into this. When someone says, this is my view of, of ecclesiology, and this is how I think church would be done. And maybe this happens with some of the students who come in the seminary. And, and, and I ask them, well, have you looked up every reference to the church in the New Testament? Have you looked up every verse that says church and every explanation of how a church should function? Uh, no. Do you even know how many there are? Uh, no. So then, you know, like I've said before, it's, it's like the individual who says, look, I've never studied this, and I don't know much about it, but I believe this is the answer. What? Not helpful. There are, the word ecclesia appears a and 14 times in eight forms in 111 verses in the New Testament. Okay, just for a statistic. If we include the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, then there are an additional 217 occurrences, just to be putting up numbers. So now you're looking up and studying more than 300 verses with just that word in it to get a sense of the use of that word. Again, if you keep reading through that, that particular paragraph that's there, you begin to realize, well, that's only one word of which many other words are connected throughout the Old and the New Testament. Words such as synagogue, words such as um, uh, assembly, solemn assembly, uh, congregation, holy convocation, all these other terms that begin, by the time you, you pile up all of these references, and, and for some of these, for example... You, you look at the word ecclesia as it's used and what, what different words it happens to tra translate. And it translates about three different words in the Old Testament. And then you look up all the occurrences of those particular words. Pretty soon you're studying thousands of verses. Which is good and tremendously fun. I mean, it, it, just, it just keeps going and digging and digging and digging. But what's shocking is when you get just a bunch of people, I, I guess it, it, it kind of reminds me of on our campus in India where we had to dig a well. And we're, we're thinking, how do we dig this well? I mean, how do we figure out where the water might be? 
and, and the, the one man who, who was the project manager, worked for in the community, he said, well, I got two guys I'd like to bring in. One of them carries a stick around, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and he's got just this way of figuring it out. You know, and there's different ways people refer to that, and some people think it's a little hokey, and some people think it's a little mystical. And uh, he said, and "I got another guy who 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 will come, and, and he's got like a, a a little readout, and he'll put something on the ground, and he, and he'll take some readings." You know, I, I said, well, "Which of these guys seems to be more effective?" I said, "Bring them both on the same day, and let's see if they come up with similar things." Uh, they didn't, you know, and so uh, each gave like two, and we drilled one hole, nothing. We drilled another hole, nothing. You know, eventually there was this one, but that was going to be right in the way of our, our walkway. So we said, oh, well, let's move over a little bit out of the, and we drilled there and got a little bit of water. Right? These guys don't know a thing. And we were struggling for about 15 years on the campus with water. We thought, we, we really need another well. How are we going to figure out where to drill? And it came back to the same thing. And what it really seems like is when people stand and look at the ground, it's hard to tell what's under there, you know? And especially when under there is a lot of rock formations, and at what point there might also be water passing under some of that rock, no way to know so what we finally did was simply this you know what uh, with all the future expansion that we might plan to do and all the different things this would be the most convenient location let's drill here and pray real hard <laughs> and God was wonderfully merciful to us the one well that we drilled with absolutely no professionals or, or uh, has uh, is a geyser and has provided abundant water for everything on the campus that now we can we can irrigate we can, everything that we need has come and it wasn't even from a guest that anybody saying i think this will work it was well wouldn't it be great if this worked let's pray and, and see if god would be kind to give us w water because he alone knows anyway what's under there and it's just amazing how, how frequently we get to conclusions. The reason why it's like a treasure that you have to dig for is you got to dig for it. And a lot of us want to be able to just glean off the surface and then think that we've grasped the deep things. Let's be careful. So, and also I would say this myself, studying and restudying these things through the years has brought many corrections and revisions to my previous understanding. So it's, it's, it, uh, very challenging for us to overcome and sometimes what's helpful is even to get out of our little box some of us come uh, from a particular denomination born and raised in the sbc or or born you know and that's all you've ever known and so you got this way of thinking how they do it is biblical because we are the best well is that right is it not possible that certain practical practices, wisdom of man, traditions of men have crept into how things are done? All right, so a lot to consider there. Um, in terms of the word, a lot of people like to draw out the fact that it is a compound word from the bottom paragraph on page one. Uh, ecclesia from the word ek and kaleo, ek meaning out of or out from, and kaleo meaning called. Ecclesia, so called out ones is the original meaning. Those who are called out, in a sense, called out from their homes to come together. Uh, so it came to mean simply the idea of assembly. But even then, when you study words, be careful to overthink compound words. If we just break the word into its component parts, we will understand it better butter fly so how did that compound word if you understand butter then you will have a better understanding of butterflies is that right 
I don't think so. I don't, I don't know how butterfly got called butterfly. Maybe it's smooth in flight. But the fact is, just because something's a compound word, sometimes you put those words together and it no longer means the independent parts. You know, that, that will no, not have any, any connection to butter any longer. So go on with me to page two, where now we start to get into the scripture. And so with regard to that, first of all, I want to address to you the non-church passages. Again, let me state that. Non-church passages. Passages that use the word ecclesia, but it is not a reference to believers at all. So let us see. It's simply carrying the idea of assembly or gathering. Now, the first occasion that we find it in the book of Acts here, referencing not the church, it is a reference to the Old Testament. And we're gonna, we can see a few of those, and we will in a moment. Um, it says this, Moses said, who, who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Uh, that's Acts 7, 37. Uh, this is the one, this Moses, who was in the congregation, in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai with our fathers, and he received the living oracles to give to us. This is accounted also in Deuteronomy chapter 9. So what is that saying? The word ecclesia there is now a reference to all of the children of Israel who have gathered at the base of Mount Sinai to hear God deliver the law. So, now listen, they were an assembly. They were a group of called out people, but they are not the church in the same way that the church is established in Christ. In other words, there are many who are part of that congregation who will not be saved. Indeed, most of them. I would dare say in an estimation, just uh, as we're talking about, these are those who came out of Egypt and all died in the wilderness in disobedience and disbelief and did not enter that rest, seems to be an indication that in this occasion, almost all of the ecclesia was unsaved, okay? Because it wasn't a church which sadly the King James translated at church even in this passage. Uh, the translators here went with congregation so that we would not get confused. And so sometimes it's helpful when they choose different words. For example, uh, the same word for us at times that is a, a word for apostles, which we think of as those uniquely appointed ones that Christ would send and speak with authority, to establish a foundation of the church. Uh, the same word apostles is also used generally of other messengers in the New Testament. And it's often translated messengers. Which keeps the reader from confusing those things. Okay. So, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 10. Is if we go back now into the Old Testament use of it. It says this, how on that day. You stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. Horeb, again, is in the, uh, is in the uh, Sinai region. So Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb are not speaking of different things. These are interchangeable uh, terms for mountains in the same region. Uh, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the way that it's stated, and, and this, is a, this is an early use of that term. And, and here, what's interesting is it's stated in, in a verb form. Gather the people to me that they may hear, and I will speak to them that they may learn. Now, what's interesting is, and you'll, you'll see it there. I've put it there in the Hebrew for you, and the, and the Hebrew is the word kahal. And I put it there also for you, uh, the, the, 
They used a, fr a whole phrase in the Greek Septuagint to explain this idea. This says, um, basically it says, the assembly of the Lord was to assemble or was to gather before me the people. So again, the emphasis is on gathering, assembling, congregating, coming together. Okay. It involves calling out, but it's not just calling out. It's calling out and calling together. Let's see a little bit more of it. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, it says again, spoke these words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. So they were gathered in such a way that it could be spoken or sung and they could all hear and receive it. Jude, Judges chapter 20, verse 2. It says, The chiefs of the people and all the tribes presented themselves in the assembly of God's people. So you've, you've got this, this, this regular reference that it is God's people at times, in this context, God's people in the old covenant definition gathered together. They were generally referred to as an assembly or an ecclesia or a kahal or a miskra, they were generally referred to by these words not just when they were roaming, not when they were sleeping, but when they came out and gathered together. Look with me further beyond Israel gathered, we look at a mob, a riot, and a planned organization. This is a gathering of pagans. In Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, it says this Now some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Now I know when I read that, you think I'm making a reference to modern churches. <laughs> they were in confusion, and most did not know why they had come together. And many just stopped coming together all of a sudden. We, no, this is not a reference to modern churches, but I, I, I see a parallel for sure. This is actually, as Paul has gone there and he's preached the gospel, people are fighting over it. A riot is breaking out. They, they have come. How is it an assembly? How is it an ecclesia? It's an ecclesia because all the people came together. That's the, that's the emphasis that's taking place here. And, and, and also in this context, it's the problem. Because in the Roman society, they were not supposed to have these kinds of riots, these kinds of mobs, assemblies that weren't part of the planned structure. For example, it will tell you in Acts 19 verse 39. As the, the, the leader of that community is speaking to them, he says, If you seek anything further, it shall be settled at the regular assembly. You got, you got confusion, you got concerns, you got accusations, you got issues. We have, we have scheduled gatherings to deal with those things. So you got to wait until we have that regular gathering and then you come for it. Further explained in the next two verses. For we are really in danger of being charged with rioting today. Not something they want because it meant that their region would soon be overrun by soldiers. And soldiers had certain rights of demands among the people. And, and you remember seeing those things even in Jesus. They could demand your cloak. They could demand for you to uh, uh, carry their gear for a certain distance. They, life was not near as convenient and comfortable when you were overrun with a, the with a military in those days. And so it says, we're in danger of being, riot, uh, being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. The ecclesia. Now, this is the group that had just gathered together, 
not at regular times. They hadn't even been gathered together because they'd been specifically called out. So as time went by, the word did not always mean called out. It became a general reference at times for any gathering. When people come together. Let's move on and see it now more in its Christian church passages. Um, but they present also not merely one view, but a few. Okay, One of the ways that the scriptures teach us regarding the church, more like we understand the church, is what some call the church universal or the church invisible which is the the biggest and broadest definition for church, and that is all the believers of all time. So that would potentially include uh, uh, Adam, Abel, Abraham, all the way on down, the totality of all those who will be saved by Christ make up the members of the church. Now, let me show you the verses that speak of that, that the church. So the Bible speaks of the church. So there's a sense in which we say there is only one church. And at the same time, we will say there are many churches. Wait a second. Is there one or is there many or are there many? And yes, it is. The answer is yes once again. Well done. But, it, but I give you a few examples. Again, in Ephesians chapter 5, it is interesting when, uh, when writing to Ephesians, instead of, Paul often will write to the church in Thessalonica. He will write to uh, the, ch- the church in Rome. But to the Ephesians, he writes to all the saints in Ephesus. Because to them... He's going to use the church in that letter predominantly to speak of the church, not the local church. So he's a little more cautious in his use of it. And we see it here in uh, Acts 5, 25. Uh, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The church in Ephesus? Well, yes, but not only the church in Thessalonica, the church in Laodicea, the church in Thyatira. I mean, even potentially the church in Marshall, right? The church, listen, and gave himself up for her. So in that definition, we have the church as being inclusive of all those for whom Jesus gave himself. So that is all the believers from all time, all the elect from all time, all the saved from all time, from creation until the absolute uh, return of Christ. All who will ever be saved. And what does he do for the church in giving himself up? That he, again, I reference this a lot, but since at times we get newcomers, it gives me the opportunity to say it once again. There is a curious uh, problem our translations often have with regard to the subjunctive. Subjunctive is a, a... a way of using words in the Greek. Now, subjunctive carries this sense. It either speaks of something that is possible, a condition, this may or this might happen, or it speaks of a purpose. So whether a subjunctive is a, is a possibility clause or a purpose clause is known by the words that precede it. Okay, for some reason, translators, for the most part, you'll know something is subjunctive because they put the word might. Okay, the word might is not a word that you actually literally find in the Greek language. That is a word added by the English because it's in the subjunctive. But whenever it is preceded with words such as that, so that, In order that, 
it's a purpose clause. It's not talking about possibilities. Now it's talking about what is purposed because what was the condition has already been accomplished so that now it will be done. The, the condition that brings about the cleansing and sanctifying is that Christ gave his life. So that, now let me keep reading. And by reading, I'm going to read it ignoring the mites because the mites don't belong there. So that, or uh, the, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. I mean, having cleansed her, she is sanctified. It's not a possibility. So that he present the church to himself in splendor without wrinkle and without spot, that she be holy and without blemish. You get it? So that's, a, that, that's something to, to remember as you're reading. When you see the that, the in order that, the so that, the might doesn't need to be there. Or the may. The may or the might can confuse us. And for many of those who have theological uh, differences from us, no, it doesn't say he accomplished it. It, it, he, it says he made it, he made it possible. No, no, no. He cleansed us. It's, it, it also says, keep reading, having cleansed her. This is talking about not what Christ made possible. This is talking about what Christ accomplished in the giving of himself. And our translations just weaken it a bit. And it, it disturbs me a bit. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has over, made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. The church of God that he obtained with his own blood. Now, this is interesting because we'll look at this one later because there's two references in this one verse. You've got the church of God that he obtained with his own blood and you have the local expression of it, which is a flock of which they are shepherds to look after. So let's see then the second one. So the church, one sense, is one church saved from all time. Secondly, we actually see the word church used singular uh, 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 of throughout various regions. Look what it says. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. Wait a Church singular, Galilee, Judea, and Samaria, you've got this broad region, but you have just one church. What's going on? And I can proffer to you a possibility. Please note when I say it is a possibility, it's not a guarantee. It's not a lock. But the strong likelihood as we read the, the sense of this, uh, and, and we're working our way uh, through the scriptures, particularly in the, the early scriptures, the reason why it's the church in all of these areas is because you're not yet having in Galilee and you're not yet having in, in, in Samaria their own established, equipped, trained up elders. They have not shepherds. So the ones who are looking after them and traveling out to teach to them, to minister to them, are likely who? The apostles and, and, and elders who are there at the church in Jerusalem. So the reason why we don't have the churches in these areas, where later you would see uh, the letter is written to the churches in Galatia. So you have multiple churches in Galatia at that time because you have individual assemblies established with their individual leadership. Whereas here early on, you have only the apostles providing the leadership for the early church. And secondarily, we really see the strongest sense of a second church plant really seems to come about in Antioch. As uh, there are believers gathered together in Antioch and they send Barnabas. 
And Barnabas goes there and he encourages the believers in that place. And then he goes and gets Paul. And when, he, when Paul comes back, they, uh, and remember, uh, Barnabas also in, at some point had introduced Paul to the leadership of the church. They come and as they are now there, sent by the established leaders, it says they spoke and taught with the church for a whole year. Acts chapter 12. So the, the a second church was established then in Antioch as leadership was also established there. Now look with me also where the church is plural. Churches, many churches. Now, obviously putting the word church on a sign does not properly make it so. Right? I mean, I, oh, there are a multitude of cults which use the term church. I mean, there are those that we know with an absolute false gospel and, and supplementary books to the Bible, Pearl of Great Price and Book, uh, book of Mormon, uh, all this stuff, and they call themselves the church of the Latter-day Saints. So simply using the term does not make it so. Let's go on a little deeper and see. So that uh, I want to go on to page three. Yes. The church as a local flock or body of believers with assigned shepherds. That is a local church. It's oft called the visible church. It's uh, 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 that belongs to the church. That uh, and the the those who are in the local church as true believers, also belong to the church, which is called the universal or invisible church. Sometimes we even go further and we'll refer to the church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant are those of us who are still trying to fight the good fight still waging the war with the passions of the flesh within us, still struggling against principalities and powers and all of the struggles that we have, whereas the church militant are those who have passed from this life, I mean, the church triumphant, the, they have finished the race, they have fought the good fight, now they are present with the Lord, they are, that, um, they are the souls of the saints made perfect as it says in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And so on, uh, in Acts chapter 8, we see Saul approved of the execution. Um, all right, go on, go on down with me further. Uh, Acts chapter 20 says, uh, pay uh, careful attention to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, Paul says this to the elders from the church at Ephesus who have come to meet him. In 1 Corinthians, he writes, to the church of God that is in Corinth. It says in Acts 15, he went through the churches of Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we've got, we've got men who say, the Bible only teaches about local churches, not a universal church. No. We got people on the other side who says, no, there is only one true church and, and, and there's no such thing as the local church. They're wrong. The Bible teaches of not, uh, not only of the one true church, but it also teaches of the local churches, which are to be expressions of that one true church. The one true church is made up of only and exclusively those who have been united to Christ by faith and truly cleansed and forgiven of their sin. The local church, on the other hand, will be composed of those who have professed faith in Christ, who have declared themselves to believe in him, who have uh, been baptized and said, I follow him, but sometimes, as the scripture warns, they're false brethren. Sometimes they're not truly born again, and we get a, a little picture of that even when uh, early on, uh, Philip, when he baptized Simon the magician, by the time Peter and, them, and John came down and they... Um, 
uh, laid hands on the people and they received the Holy Spirit, Simon the magician, his, his real heart cropped up. He did not have a, a, a faith in the exclusiveness of the God of the Scripture and the salvation that is in Christ. He was impressed that it was a bit more magic and a bit more power and a bit more impressive than what he had access to before. And now he wants access to this and he's willing to pay for it. And Peter says, you are still trapped, caught in the gall of bitterness. But he had already been baptized. He had already been added. Look, you even get those who not only are baptized and are added, but maybe they've completed seminary and begun ministry such as a Demas. Demas, not a Demas. Uh, a person like Demas where he followed Paul, was one like Timothy, and Timothy took, uh, Paul took Timothy, Paul took Titus, Paul took Demas. These men would have uh, roles in ministry and service. And then Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. So, they went out from us, John says in 1 John. Why? Because they were not of us. So they joined us. What was their motives? Who knows what personal family tragedy they had gone, to, gone through. I mean, and this is something that sometimes I think that we have to get um, into our own mind. God always uses the, uh, uses the gospel to save people. So opportunities to share the gospel are, are absolutely to be made use of. But let us be careful because we can get ourselves in the notion of this. You know what? At funerals, people are more open to listen. They're more sensitive. They're more receptive. You do realize that until God sends the Spirit to them and gives them understanding and gives them eyes to see and ears to hear and imparts to them faith, they will not be saved. People in, a, in an emotional, sensitive state, it is easier to get a temporary and potentially superficial response from them. But then we often wonder, why didn't they continue? You know, they came for a while and they went away. Or sometimes you'll come to know this, and it, it, it's a heartbreaking experience. You'll get someone joining the uh, church and, and starting to come for a while, and you'll realize they're going through a... Um, uh, um, a, a relational issue uh, in their life, or they're going through um, a, a health matter of grave concern, and, and these tragedies have driven them to go to the church, thinking, maybe God will help me with this problem. If I, if I do him a little favor, he'll do me a little favor. And that it may be in time, if that illness is not diseased, that social uh, uh, relational issue is not resolved, they just go away again. And it may be that they came for all the wrong reasons, but in the mercies of God, they heard the gospel and God made them new in Christ Jesus, okay? So uh, whatever reason that they may came, I I'm just saying, there is so much that we cannot know and cannot see. And that's why, but the church is to be a pure body of believers. So when someone is proving by their lifestyle not to be a true follower of Christ because they're living in sin, in disobedience, then the church was to begin church discipline. And if they do not turn back from their sin, which we'll consider down the road, if they do not, then the church was ultimately to put them out. Because they needed to understand, look, you, you, we're you recognizing you are unwilling to listen to Christ. If you're unwilling to listen to Christ, it makes no sense. You're not part of us. But I am. I'm saved. I believe. The demons believe and shudder. You know that, right? The demons and the devil have far better doctrinal understanding than most believers do. 
I mean, they understood that Jesus was the Son of God. They, well, why have you come to torment us before the time? They knew that this was not the time that the legion would be tormented. They have some degree of understanding. When Satan went to tempt Jesus, he was quoting Scripture. Misappropriating, misapplying, but nonetheless quoting. Heartbreaking when the devil knows the Scripture better than believers. But... Um, so this is the, the church. Now also on uh, Acts 15, 4. No, I read that. Hebrews 12, 23. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to the God who is the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Uh, lastly also, I mean, as I, as I unpack it. Sometimes... We think of, okay, so you've got the church in Ephesus, you've got the church in Rome, but you got to realize this. We say, well, we've got one city here, and this one city has more than one church. Yes? Also, we do realize that very early on, the church in Jerusalem had 5,000 plus members. So, whose house were they meeting in? I mean, whose hall were they meeting in? I mean, it becomes pretty challenging. Uh, when, when Peter comes out of prison that night, he goes to um, uh, uh, Mark's mother's house where he knows the church will be gathered praying for him. All of them? Of course not. So, so in certain places, you actually, you, you, the, the word assembly, well, on, let, me just, let me just read these verses for you. In Rome, okay, he's writing to the church in Rome, and he says this to them. Um, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers who risk their lives, uh, their neck uh, for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks. Greet also the church in their house. So there is the church in Rome, which is all the believers in Rome. And then there is, seems to be, smaller assemblies that meet in different houses. So does it get complicated? It does. And so we've got to be very, very cautious when, we're, when we see the word church to not assume that we understand the totality of of what that means. Again, also we see in Philemon, it says also to uh, um, greet, uh, he greets Philemon and, and also the church in his house. In Corinth also, it says this, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine may be recognized. Now, with regard to Corinthians, for example, um, there are many who see that part of the challenge is you had, uh, remember, God kept Paul in Corinth a little bit longer when he was ready to leave. He said, because I have many people in this city. You remember that? And so there ended up being a large number of believers and yet in many of these places, particularly in pagan places, where were the large groups of believers going to meet? Difficult for them to meet in toto regularly. So oftentimes they would meet in various houses and the di different elders would, would oversee the, the, and or vary in the different groups. And that's how you even get a circumstance like you kind of do in Corinth. You've got this house church that, that loves Paul, this one Apollos, this one Cephas, and you, you start to have all of these divisions. But when they, and they, they also did, did this, at times all of them would come together. Now listen, and, I, and we're, we're out of time today, so I want to say this quickly. When these, when these churches in the houses would come together as the church in Corinth, this was not an ecumenical activity. 
All right? This wasn't different denominations with different doctrine and different practices, just all putting aside their differences and coming together. This is the fact that the church was not supposed to have differences. And the problem was when the church was coming together, their differences were really showing up. But the difference is would start to show who among them is true, who is genuine, and who is not genuine. And so so we've got to um, be really careful in the handling of these things. And then I'm going to end with this this last section here, which is uh, just a quick, fun little ending. Regarding the Christian church, who does it belong to? Who builds it? Who bought it? Yes, indeed. Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter on this rock, and we'll unpack that passage in a couple weeks. I will build. So who builds it? He does. We're thankful to be used as tools and instruments in that service, but we, we plant and we water. God alone provides the increase. He will build his church, and it says, I will build my church church. Whose church is it? See, this is one of the things that sometimes nags at me. People will often say, oh, what church do you go to? Well, I go to brother, I go to pastor so-and-so's church. What? It ain't his church? Well, if it is, we got a problem. (laughs) Because that's not how it's supposed to be. The, The church is not ultimately be, to be connected to a man. That was supposed to be part of the beauty of a plurality of elders is that people did not fix their eyes on a singular man. We are to fix our eyes most extraordinarily on a singular one, but that is on Christ. Other than that, we can also remember and look to our leaders and see the leaders plural and the example that they have for us. Um, but Christ, it is His church He will build it, and in Acts 20, verse 28, it is the church of God which he obtained with his blood. As it says in Revelation 5, 9, which he purchased for God from every language, tribe, nation, and people. Who bought it? Jesus. Who builds it? Jesus. Who owns it? I guess I could even add one more, Uh, not not only... uh, yeah, who, who, it, who it belongs to, who builds it, who bought it. I could say, also say, and who's the boss of it. There is but a single head of the church, you know. It doesn't matter how fancy a hat you put on. It doesn't matter if your hat is nearly two feet tall. That will not make you the head of the church. It doesn't matter What your robe is inscribed with and what it looks like, it doesn't matter if you're selected by committee or what. There is and always will remain one head of the church, that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And every church that will be a true church will be one that organizes itself faithfully and orderly under His headship and His instruction. Lord, thank you that we could consider this tonight and and really to some degree just uh, blow out some misconceptions and stereotypes and and see that your word as you unfold it for us um, has some, uh, to a degree, complicated but from another angle, uh, rich and complex and deep expressions. Lord, and we think and hope that as we uh, consider not only... um, the various definitions, but as we get into the foundation of the church and as we more particularly look at the function of the church, oh God, I pray that you would bless our consideration. I pray that you would, you would move us with a preparedness because of the difficult times we face now and the potential for an increase and a recurrence of troublesome times in the future. Lord, may the church be bold enough to function as the church, come what may in the way that you've called us to. Grant us wisdom and patience and perseverance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.